Welcome back to the channel, everybody. I am Brian Lee Durfee, author of The Forgetting Moon and The Blackest Heart, both books published by Simon & Schuster Saga Press today. I'm going to be talking about all the best King Arthur novels that, you know, I would recommend. You know, it's why I wore my Stonehenge shirt. I bought this at Stonehenge in the gift shop when I was at Stonehenge. And as we know, most of the King Arthur myths take place in and around that part of Southern England. So I thought it fitting. Anyway, let's get started on all of the, the this is my collection of King Arthur books right here. And we're gonna talk to him. I'm gonna leave my favorite two series for last, but I'm gonna talk about all of them. And so let's start with the very first um, exposure I had to King Arthur in literature was when I was in high school, I bought The Crystal Cave by Mary Stewart. This is the exact copy of the book that I bought whilst in high school. I still have it, still in good condition. You know, we always review the covers, so we're going to talk about a little bit about the series itself, but we're also going to kind of critique the covers. I like these covers. Got this very, very nice late 1960s, early 1970s sort of styled illustration. And then in book two, actually, I don't know if this is book two, three, or four. I know this is book one. But in this book, The Hollow Hills, we've also got kind of this framed illustration. And then in book I don't know if this is book two, three, or four either, but it's also got kind of the same theme with the illustration on the cover. And then book two, three, or four again. It's got this great... And so together, if we put them together on the shelf, they look like a pretty good matching set except for book number one, which doesn't fit at all. But, you know, what can you do? We'll give it a, about a B plus for the covers. Just because good, we would have given them an A, but the spines here don't all match. It's kind of like, you know, 75%, you know. We got it 75% right, publisher, and 25% fucked up. Now, The Crystal Cave is kind of, uh, it was like I said, my first exposure to King Arthur literature. I loved it. It's um, not young adult, but I wouldn't say, I think it's kind of like between young adult and adult in tone and it's kind of PG-13. It's just a pretty, it's a very gorgeously well-written story of the King Arthur myth. There's nothing extraordinary about it other than it was, um, I think anybody that reads them will enjoy them. They're fairly straightforward. Very, very well-written. Now let's talk about the second King Arthur book that I ever read, and that was The Mists of Avalon by uh, Marion Zimmer Bradley. Um, this one was, um, you know, the author herself is very controversial. I think the book is extraordinarily well written. It's told from the female perspective of all the female characters that are involved in the King Arthur myth. So if you like a book that takes that approach. I've only read this once. Again, I read this when I was a, a probably freshman or sophomore in college. Now, my third exposure to King Arthur was when I started to collect the Stephen R. Lawhead um, Pendragon cycle of books. There's five books in this series. Series. They start with Taliesin, which takes place. This is Merlin's grandfather and it takes place on the isle of atlantis and he's sort of a bard thus we've got the har harp icon and then book two is about merlin as a youngster and then book um three of course we get introduced to young king arthur and then book four it's more king arthur stuff stuff the uh book is called pendragon and then book five it's called Grail. As you can imagine, they go on a quest for the Holy Grail. These also are very well written. Um, gives you a very good look at medieval life. And look at the spines. As far as the spines go, we got to give it an A+, plus because they all look like they're part of the same series. It just looks good on the shelf. And then 
Uh, of course, the covers all have the same theme, so we're going to give the covers a, a rousing stand-up ovation, because of all the series that I've got, this one's the only one that did it right, as far as cover artwork and spines go, and keeping them consistent. And it's a very, very, very well-written, um, very PG-rated, though, because Stephen R. Lawhead is kind of a, uh, his, his stuff sort of leans towards the Christian end of things, which is fine. Very good. So then I also read in high school, um, not high school, college, college, I also read Le Morte de Arthur. I've got uh, two versions of that here. I've got this nice hardcover here and then this little paperback. Le Morte de Arthur, one of the very first books by Sir Thomas Mallory. I think this was written in, and I should have done my research on this, but it was written, God, in like the 1300s or 1400s or something. This is old, old, old stuff. And it reads like old, old, old stuff. It reads as if King Arthur was written by the same guys that wrote the King James Version of the Bible. It's very, it's very um, set up in, in scriptural language with lots of these, thous, thys, and where, and, and all that stuff. Very, uh, can be a slog if you're not into that kind of writing. If you, if you don't want to read King Arthur via King James Version scriptor, scriptorial speak, you might want to stay away from this version of King Arthur. But if you do read it, you're in for a treat because it's probably the um, most complete story, the most complete telling of the King Arthur myth, if that makes sense. I mean, everything is in here. Every single knight of the round table is mentioned. Every single myth and legend is mentioned. And every quest that they ever go on is mentioned. Um, so if you want that, and then another book that I read whilst in college was King Arthur and His Knights by Howard Pyle, the great illustrator Howard Pyle. The problem with this book is, at least the problem with the version I've got, is Howard Pyle did some magnificent illustrations of the King Arthur story when he did his King Arthur book. They're just not in this book that I have. The illustration, which is kind of why you would want, if you have a Howard Pyle King Arthur book, you would more than likely want one that has all of his illustrations in it. This one doesn't. So we give it a flat F. And it's hard to find books with all of... I mean, now he does have a few of black and white illustrations that he's done, but he's got dozens and dozens of color illustrations that I've got in my Howard Pyle uh, art book, which I can look at those in the art book, so I know what they are. But anyway, uh, this one, I wouldn't really recommend get anybody getting this version of the book. It's a little bit of a waste of time. Also, in college, I read um, The Once and Future King by T.H. White. Uh, this is uh, this is kind of a, almost like a real fairy tale childlike version, very naive version of the King Arthur myth, where rabbits talk and uh, animals talk and things like that. It's like it's like uh, King Arthur as if it was, uh, you know, set in Redwall, or Watership Down or something like that. But you know, it's it's got some uh, great uh, interesting things going on in it, and it's also very well written. Now, we've sort of went through the history of which books I read when, like in high school, college, this, that, and the other. Now let's talk about my two most favorite King Arthur series. And so let's start with um, the Bernard Cornwell Warlord Chronicles, which begins with the Winter King. And not only that, but these one of the reasons these are special to me is because I got these all signed to me by the author because I have met Bernard Cornwell. Now, if, you've, if you want to read, this is the trilogy. It's the Winter King, the Enemy of God, and Excalibur. This is the trilogy that I would recommend anybody start with if they really want to start somewhere in the King Arthur lore is because Bernard Cornwell writes so well. Maybe you've read his last kingdom uh, books, his uh, his books about the, the Vikings, or maybe you've seen the series Last Kingdom that uh, 
I don't remember who did it, Netflix or BBC or Showtime, but it's, he does great things. Or maybe you've seen the uh, Sharps Rifles series with uh, starring Sean Bain. Anyway, Bernard Cornwell is a great historical novelist, and this is his historical take on King Arthur and what it might have been like in King Arthur's day and age. And it's very grim, very gritty, very bleak um, times of the Middle Ages. And I like this one just because it's just so, so, so good. So good. All of the King Arthur myths are present, and it's told as if it's told as if there's no there's no happy fairy tale magic in this. That's all I'm gonna say. Let's look at the covers. Okay, the covers. Well, we've got a kind of got a shit mix mishmash of all sorts of different kind of styles here. Um, the the latter two sort of have a kind of a style going. The first one has this kind of a. They're not really matching any of them. Uh, this this has got like this bold graphic with the helmet. This has got this wonderful Francis Lord Francis Dixie painting. I think that's the name of the artist. And this one has a painting by. I don't know who that is, but anyway, together they look okay, but if you check out the spines, the spines again are just a cluster of, uh, of stuff that don't go together at all, but that's all right. I mean, we'll just assume that, you know, whatever it is, what it is. Can't do nothing about it. The books themselves are fucking dope though. So let's put those back over here. Now let's get to the last series and probably the most important series that I wanted to share with you. And it might just edge out Bernard Cornwell as my favorite. And that is this 10 book series called The Camulod Chronicles by Jack White. Now it starts over here, 10 books. Let's go through them one book at a time. We've got book one, The Burning Stone, which takes place probably three or 400 years before King Arthur is born, where his relatives are fascinated by these meteorites that crash to earth and level the forests and leave big craters. And then book two is called The Sky Stone. Um, you know, book one has got this sort of graphic of a burning stone, then book two has is The Sky Stone. These books do not match. The covers do not match whatsoever. They couldn't be further from, apart from each other. But whatever, this has got a, a John Howe painting on it, and John Howe worked with Peter Jackson on The Lord of the Rings. John Howe and Alan Lee were the main art directors of that. It's got, I mean, it's a decent cover. It's the Sky Stone, it's about, set about 200 or so years before King Arthur, where they take a Sky Stone, where they take one of these um, meteorites that's fallen into a lake and um, create, and they call it the Lady of the Lake, right? And they create, they may or may not create a very important sword out of that sky stone. Book number three is The Singing Sword, which may or may not have been created out of a meteorite. Just giving you hints here. I'm trying to help you along. Again, the cover is wildly different from the first two. So we're we're batting a thousand in um, like mismatched co covers so far. Book four, we even get a different graphic design. This is the Eagle's Brood. Now this is this is more talking about um, Merlin and Uther. Um, Uther being uh, Arthur's father. So this is the story of Merlin and Uther. And it's, I like the cover, but it doesn't match. So the first four books don't match thematically at all. But they start to write the ship with the last six books. So then we get a book titled just Uther, which is about um, the latter half of King Uther's life. And uh, it's got this great cover by John Harris. And then we, then the last five books are about King Arthur himself, where we've got the Saxon shore. He's a young, young boy in this one. Another great John Harris painting, which matches book five. And then we've got The Sorcerer, another great John Harris painting. And there you can see the iconic Sword in the Stone. And then we've got Fort at River's Bend. This would be book number eight. Another great John Harris painting. Book number nine, The Lance Thrower. I'll give you a guess which character 
is central to this one. Another great John Harris painting. And then book number 10, The Eagle, which closes out the um, whole 10 book series. Another great John Harris painting. So as you can see, the final six books look super good because they have, um, if I can, if I can hold them up without, you know, dropping them. So they've all got covers and uh, spines that sort of match. They're upside down, I know. I can't do this. I'm bound and determined to do this and show you that these all look good together on the shelf. The first four books are sort of the bastard children of the 10 books. But anyway, together they create a magnificent 10 book series on King Arthur. And maybe you've seen my review of these first two books where I talk about how just Jack White encapsulates everything he knows about medieval history and medieval life and how grim and bleak it could be to live in those days and ages when King Arthur was, you know, rumored to have lived. And he takes this King Arthur story and he really boils it down to, um, what would it have been like if King Arthur was a person and people thought he was magic? What if people thought that his sword was magical and that things that Merlin were doing was magical? But let's say all of it could be explained by natural phenomena. That's what I love about the story is there's no magic in it. But every character desperately, desperately believes in magic because they've seen these meteorites and these sky stones and these swords that just have different properties to them and and um the clever ways in which king arthur pulls the sword out of the stone when nobody else can do it and jack white describes that whole scene in a way that makes sense like you could be like oh i can see how people would be fooled into thinking that was a magical event when really it was just a trick a, mer a trick of merlin like a like you know like like david copperfield's magic act in vegas we know it's not magic it's all sleight of hand and that's kind of what we've got here. It's Merlin is a trickster. He is a magician in a way that we know magicians and that it's all behind the scenes tomfoolery. Okay, so that's why I love this series of books. I love it, love it, love it. These are my um, King Arthur collections. So if you can think of any that I missed that I might want to buy someday, just please drop a line. If, if, if there's something here that looks interesting to you, go ahead and pick it up. But that is my... King Arthur Arthurian Legends book collection.